Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, folks, Big Paul here today with another anabolic Q&A. We have some good questions on deck today. We're going to talk about Serostim, getting fat on refeed days, and whether or not trend causes upset stomach. Some people get upset stomach from trend, how that works. And we have a lot more questions. We're going to dig into all those in just one second. All right, first question up today is from Walter Sharpley. Are you still mixing Serostim and generic specifically? Are you doing a little Sero with a little generic in one shot or just multiple times a day? Thanks. I have been using generics over the last several months since I was on my off-season phase. Serostim is very expensive and it's hard for me to justify spending that much money on Serostim especially when I have kids and I'm trying to save for college for my kids. So it makes it a little hard to justify spending the money on Sarah STEM. With that said, I am going to add it back in on contest prep. The testing that I have seen on generic shows that it is legit. It is real, but there does seem to be some magic to Sarah STEM. I can't rationalize it. I don't understand why. Maybe it's all a placebo but it seems like you do respond better to Serostem. So I am going to do a combination of Serostem and generics on contest prep. I would not mix the Serostem with the generics. I know that it's probably fine, but I don't want to do anything to cause damage to the Serostem because it is so expensive. So usually what I do on contest prep is I break my HGH up into three doses during the day. I'll do an AM dose, fast it, then I'll do a pre-workout dose. I work out in the early evening, usually around six o'clock. And then I'll do a pre-bed dose where I will take the Serostem pre-bed. So I will do two shots of generic, one shot of Serostem, probably for somewhere around 12 units, nine units, I'm not sure, per day. I'm gonna cut it down a little bit. I was up to 15 units of generic, but I may back that down a little bit. I don't know that you need as much on contest prep. And we'll see what happens but that's my plan for contest prep with HGH. All right, next question here is from GT3 Shreds 510. Why does my body always gain fat after a refeed day? No matter how clean I eat, I gain fat. If it's truly difficult for the body to convert carbs into fat, is it true that the body is primed to store fat after a period of dieting? I don't think you're gaining fat on your refeed day. It depends on what you're eating. It's so with carb cycling, here's sort of the trick. It's sort of a trick of the energy management systems. Thermodynamics is not violated, especially when you're in a diet phase. If you are glycogen depleted and on your high carb day, you eat, keep the fats low and you eat a high amount of carbs. Those carbs are likely and preferentially going to be stored as glycogen rather than being stored as fat. So in theory, you could potentially, I say potentially, eat in a surplus and not store any additional body fat. Thermodynamics has not been violated because that energy has neither been, <laughs> it hasn't been destroyed or burned. It's just stored for later use, much like your body stores fat for later use. It is storing the carbohydrates as glycogen. Now, with that said, there's no way to definitively prove that. <laughs> it's just what I've seen with people. Also, you have to keep in mind if your glycogen, let's say your glycogen is already full and you're eating into surplus, or if you're not glycogen depleted going into a high day, there is a possibility that you can store those carbs as fat. Any excess food in a surplus potentially gets stored as fat. So 
It's not to say that you can't store fat. Now, what I think is going on with you and what I'm going to speculate, you're seeing the scale go up the day after you eat your high carb day. You may even look a little bloated and a little puffy. That's not fat gain. That's water gain. When you eat a bunch of carbs, you're going to retain more fluid. And it's likely just the fluid retention. If you see it in a carb cycling diet, I've shown people before, when I measure weight, you'll see... Weight spikes up the day after the high carb day. Then it comes down to back down to where it was at before the high carb day, and you'll see it slowly decline again. And you have this zigzagging, pyramiding down uh, type of weight loss when you're in a carb cycling fat loss diet. It'll go up, and then trickle back down, up, trickle back down. So that's what you'll see. It's not actual fat gain. It's just the water retention from the additional carbs in glycogen. All right, folks, I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about the new e-course that Kurt Havens and I have put together, The Scientific Principles of Anabolics and PEDs. This is the most comprehensive PED e-course ever put together with over 80 modules, including intros to PEDs, major steroid profiles, competitor off-season cycles, non-competitor cycles, contest prep cycles, HGH fundamentals, insulin fundamentals, side effect management, safer use concepts, fat loss agents, estrogen management, and advanced PED and hypertrophy science. It is the best course out there of its kind. Go check it out. Link is in the video description below. All right, next question is from Road to Strongest Man Ever. Have you ever experienced nausea on trend and how do you fix that? Yes, you can get the trend guts. Some people get diarrhea. Some people get acid reflux from it. I don't know the exact mechanisms, but from what I've heard and the way it was explained to me, it is the it is a very potent androgen and it is the stimulation of the vagal nerve that causes upset stomach. I could be completely wrong about that. It could be also prostaglandin related. But yes, trin, especially in higher doses, causes upset stomach. I've gotten horrible acid reflux from trin. I've had the trend diarrhea before. Anybody who's used trend in higher doses has experienced that. So the way you would deal with that would just to be use less trin. Seems like a simple answer, right? Find a dose that works for you. Keep it lower. I like running daily doses. I find that if you don't have those big spikes, that it tends to keep your body more in a state of homeostasis. You don't have the problems with the yo-yos and feeling sick. Also, titrating up the dose. For me, I run very low dose trend. I get a lot out of it. I'll push other things up higher. I'm not shy about doses, as people that know me, but I keep the trend pretty low. Somewhere around 20 to 25 milligrams a day, I find for me, personally, I'm not saying this is what you should do, but I find that's optimal, an optimal trade-off between side effects and results. So right in that dose range, I get good results without major side effects. All right, next question is from Mark Bates. He asked, why does D-ball make my stomach upset after a while and put me off from eating? I feel nauseous. That happens with most orals after a while, and this is why a lot of pro bodybuilders stop taking orals in the off-season. Orals tend to stress your liver out. They, they tend to cause stomach distress. Everybody that ends up taking orals for any extended period of time they ultimately get GERD, end up with bad acid reflux. They crush your appetite. And my thought process is in the off season, if you're nauseous, if you're lethargic, if you're sick feeling and you can't eat, you're not going to grow. And that's the problem with most oral steroids. They're going to crush your appetite. They are going to cause some sort of liver stress. A lot of times when your liver is stressed out, you will have some nausea that goes along with it. Could be the drugs themselves directly causing the nausea. But this is why I generally stay away from orals in the off season. If I were to run orals, I will run them in short burst, maybe three to four weeks towards the end of a cycle when I need to get over the hump or squeeze the last little bit out. I'll do it then. And I'll keep the dose low and I will keep it on training days only. I prefer Anivar. I think Anivar gets you just what you need an extra strength boost 
in the offseason without all the nasty side effects that you get from the other orals, but eventually Anovar catches up with you too, at least in my experience. I start getting an upset stomach even on Anovar after a while. So I will sometimes run Anovar periodically, pre-workout, just a few days a week, just to get me over the hump towards the end of a cycle. And that's my approach to it. But I would generally stay away from orals in the offseason, save them for the end of contest prep, doesn't matter if your diet gets crushed at the end of contest prep we're not eating anyway so at that point it doesn't really matter and there's some other cosmetic effects that we can leverage from the orals but i find them in the off season for the most part to be unproductive especially as you get older and become a more advanced bodybuilder you'd be better off just taking more of a safer injectable compound all right nice guy 4928 asked me how do i keep my muscle when on a cut i've lost 15 pounds in two months while on test 400 trend 250 and i feel like a deflated balloon muscle nowhere near as big as it was when i was in a surplus well and the simple answer is you got to get flat to lose fat that's the old bodybuilding saying and i think a lot of times people mistake bloat and body fat for actual muscle size when you have that extra bloat on you from being bigger from taking compounds that aromatize, from eating extra food, you're going to feel bigger. You're going to feel more inflated. You're going to feel stronger in the gym. And just the God's honest truth of it, when you get ripped, you're not going to be strong. Everybody, I think Justin told me last year, Justin Harris, my coach, he told me at the end of prep, you look like Tarzan, you train like Jane. <laughs> That's that's pretty much how it is. I am the weakest and I feel the most deflated and small. You look small in shirts at the end of contest prep. But what looks good in a t-shirt in the gym doesn't look good on a bodybuilding stage. I can promise you that. And getting weaker, getting flat is just part of losing body fat. Now, once you're at a certain level of leanness, you can fill back up. But this is just part of the process that you are going to have to accept. It's just the way it is. You're going to get flat. You're going to feel small. You're going to look deflated. You're going to go through the skinny fats phase that everybody goes through when they are cutting, where you've lost your fullness, but you're not lean enough yet to see any definition. That's when a lot of guys will give up on a fat loss diet. They panic. I used to be one of those. I was a perma bulker when I was younger. I Because I was skinny when I was a teenager and I wanted to be big, I was so focused on the scale, I wanted to hit that 300-pound mark, and I didn't care how I looked. I just wanted to be 300 pounds. I wanted to look big in a t-shirt and not so great with a shirt off. I wanted to be strong in the gym, and none of those things line up well with being ripped. Now, if you want to feel big, if you want to feel full, if you want to feel strong, then maybe bodybuilding is not the sport for you. Maybe take up something like strongman or powerlifting. But you have to accept that if you are going to be a bodybuilder, if you want to have a six pack, if you want to look good at the beach, any of those things, you're going to have to accept that as part of the process. So this is a question from a random user. I like this one. <laughs> Let's say you have a midlife crisis during a cycle. Someone dies, you lose your job, your wife cheats are examples. Basically a big mental injury would it be wise to back down to trt and keep estrogen low or just keep trucking sometimes shit happens well for me the gym is therapy i enjoy being in the gym i enjoy lifting weights anytime i'm going through a tough period in my life for example i went through a nasty divorce that's what got me back in the gym probably six seven years ago i think it was i went through my divorce the gym saved me and I was running cycles. I will say this, you probably don't want to be on trend. You probably don't want to be on something that's going to affect your psychology while you're going through a crisis such as this, like a big life crisis. But I do think the gym can be healthy. The gym can be an outlet. If you're using PEDs, I would probably keep things in moderation. Stay away. Like I said, stay away from trend, stay away from halo testing. Probably not the time to be dropping A-bombs, just some tests, GH, maybe master on a Prima Bowl and you're going to feel fine. I don't find that any of those things affect my mood negatively. If anything, they make me feel better. 
I wouldn't want to create a hormonal crash and come off. If you create a hormonal crash and come off, you're probably going to be in an estrogen dominant environment, low testosterone, and you're going to be even more emotional and probably a bit irrational, maybe maybe susceptible to depression and anxiety and other things that aren't going to help your situation out. I probably would stay away from 19 Norse. Um, I already mentioned trend, but something like Nandrolone. Nandrolone can give me anxiety. Things that are going to cause anxiety, maybe even equipoise. I've heard some guys say they get anxiety from equipoise. I've never personally experienced that. So smart compound choices, keeping stable in your life, keeping things consistent. I would keep in the gym. I would keep your diet consistent. I would try to you know keep everything as balanced as you possibly can to get through those tough times. Next question, Dylan Ace Vlogs. He asks, how do you stay off PEDs? <laughs> I did an entire video about this. Once you start, you won't stop. I think it's the name of the video. If you don't want to be on PEDs, don't take them to begin with. Because I will tell you, and I've said this many, many times, this is the story I give everybody, the lesson I try to tell everybody, it's like being bitten by the vampire once you start taking PEDs. Once you're a vampire, you're going to be a vampire for the rest of your life. It is impossible to go back to training as a natty once you've been enhanced. You're not going to want to give up that feeling. You're going to fall in love with the way you look. You're going to fall in love with the attention that you get from people. You're just not want to go, going to want to go back to training natty. It's like, why did I ever do this? It becomes a part of your identity. It becomes a part of who you are for a better or for worse, it will be you're bitten by the vampire. You will be a vampire forever. So if you don't want to go that route, don't ever take them because there is no such thing as just one cycle. I don't know of anybody that just ever took one cycle. Once you start, you're going to keep going. All right. Next question is from MBBP8GC. What a username. How to suppress a constant nagging appetite normal diet foods aren't cutting it like they were before well some of it depends on how lean you are how long you have been dieting where you're at in your journey i find as you get leaner the leaner you get the appetite can get out of control if you're still fat at the beginning of a diet and you're having hunger pangs and you can't control your diet your appetite then you're in trouble so i found that productive Diet length is somewhere around 16 to 20 weeks max. Usually after about 16 weeks of dieting, you need to take a break, push the food back up, let your body sort of reset. It becomes almost unsustainable. The hunger gets out of control. The metabolism seems to downregulate. That's when you need a break. If you're a person that has disordered hunger hormone signaling, which some severely obese people do, something like Ozempic could be or generic semi-glutide could be something that you could consider. Uh, metformin seems to suppress appetite a bit as well. There are tools. Uh, eating more satiating foods. I've talked about eating higher satiety foods before. So something, for example, like a chicken breast is 200 calories. And a 7-ounce chicken breast or an 8-ounce chicken breast is like 200, 250 calories. It's pretty damn near impossible to get fat eating a chicken breast. And a chicken breast is going to be very filling. A large baked potato is something like 200 calories. So those are very, very dense foods that are low calorie. They're going to be satiating. So those are some options. So just think about that as well. But it may be a hunger hormone signaling issue. It may be an issue that you have been dieting for way too long and just need a break from dieting. It could be that you just need to nut up and be tough. <laughs> There's also that too. I love pushing myself through pain and through discomfort. It's something I take pride in. I've gotten really good at pushing myself through discomfort. I've done it you know, my entire life. I take it as a personal challenge to do things that other people can't gut through. So some of it's just up here. It's mental. You need to be able to be tough and to push through things as well. All right, next question is from my friend Caldwell Trained. He asks, as a coach, what are you looking at in progress picks or biofeedback that helps you decide when to add T3 or leave it out entirely during prep? T3 is a double-edged sword. I It is my last choice as a fat burner when I am personally prepping. 
I've found that I don't need it to get lean. What my experience has been with T3 is that it is equally as good at burning fat as it is muscle. And that's the part that I hate about it. You spend all off season working hard to gain this muscle and then you take the T3 and melt it all off. Now, some people don't, that doesn't seem to happen to. That's been my personal experience with it. So it's the last resort. If I pulled out all the stops with diet, with cardio, with training, with other fat burning options, T3 would be the last resort if I can't get anything off. Uh, and it could be that some people just have uh, thyroid, low thyroid and may need a little bit of supplementation, just a little bit to get them over the hump. But I personally try to avoid T3 like the plague for bodybuilding. I think it's counterproductive. It is necessary at times, but if you can get away without it, I would try your hardest to get away without it. All right, Dr. Marvin says DC. This is the last question. Something you used to think that mattered a lot and you no longer do and vice versa. One of my favorite, this is one of my favorite questions to ask highly experienced per professionals regardless of their field. That is a good question. So something that I used to think was critically important in bodybuilding and training when I was younger was to train to absolute failure and beyond. I used to think that you had to be an animal in the gym, that you had to leave the gym puking in a trash barrel. I remember some work. I had some epic workouts when I was younger, when I was doing DC training. And God damn it, I miss them. I love pushing myself and I love going this hard. But I remember sometimes doing Widowmakers for legs. Dante Trudeau would have you do these 20 plus rep sets on squats. And I remember throwing up. I remember having a hard time walking to my car, feeling like I was going to pass out. And my legs being so torched when I got to the car that I had to sit there for a few minutes before I could even push the gas pedal down. I couldn't even pick up my leg. I'd have to grab my leg with my hand to pick it up to put it in the car. Those are the kind of workouts that I used to do. I'm talking about pushing yourself until you're ripping ligaments off the bone, until you're tearing muscles, going beyond failure, doing forced negatives, things like that. Just absolutely insane stuff like that. And what I found is that it really doesn't help that much. You, I, there are times I do think you need to train to failure. I think when a trainer is earlier on in their journey that they need to figure out where that is at. There is a big difference between pushing 135 pounds on a squat to failure versus doing 405 for a 20 rep suicide set. <laughs> so there's a big difference in the type of fatigue that you're putting on your CNS, axial fatigue, dipping into your ability to recover, causing actual muscle damage. That, you know, doing That's another thing that's I used to think that you had to damage the muscle and cause it to repair and regrow. That is not the case. Uh, and we know from modern studies that, <laughs> that actually damaging the muscle is damage. It's not doing anything to provide extra stimulus. Your body has to spend extra resources and time to recover just to a baseline before it can even grow. So the sweet spot for training, I have found, is somewhere just short of failure. Measuring out and understanding what the stimulus to fatigue ratio of an exercise is and selecting exercises that are going to be the most productive for your hypertrophy and keeping mindful of, of training stimulus versus how much fatigue you're accumulating. Now, that's not to say that you should train like a pussy. <laughs> and a lot of people that get so concerned about pushing too hard. That's another thing that drives me nuts. Everybody's worried about overtraining. Everybody thinks that they're pushing too hard. Chances are that you are not pushing too hard. There, there are people that do. I've done it before. So you got to find that sweet spot. But I would say being more intelligent about exercise selection, you don't have to train to absolute failure to the point of burying yourself into a hole, destroying your CNS, causing damage to tissue, your joints being so sore that you can't lift for a week, things like that. <laughs> I think that is probably something that I have come full circle on. Other than that, I can't, you know, that's probably the major thing. Definitely my my thoughts on nutrition have evolved over the years. Um, I used to be a low lower carb guy. 
have come full circle. Like I beat up on people that are low carb and high intensity trainers now, but I, I did all that shit. That's why I give people a hard time because I spent many years spinning my wheels doing that crap. And then I found out, oh, this works better. But that's part of the journey. It's part of learning. It's part of evolving. It's part of becoming better. All right, folks. I hope you found this one helpful. If you have thoughts or comments, you think I'm an idiot, you disagree with me, you have a question, put them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. For coaching or consultations, head over to www.anabolicbodybuilding.com to book your spot today. I can help you with optimizing hormones, fat loss, muscle gain, physique, athletic performance, nutrition, and health. For more information, shoot me an email at bigp3rd at gmail.com.